Good afternoon. This is Christ the King Lutheran Church, and we are here for the Book of the Month Bible study that we affectionately call BOMBS. Book of the Month Bible study. Leave out the T, because otherwise that'd be like bottoms. Uh, uh, bottoms, no. <laughs> Let's stick with BOMBS. Book of the Month Bible study. And uh, we are here to do John chapter 19. Now, it's a very important chapter, but before we go any further, let us say, Alleluia! Christ is risen! He is risen indeed! Alleluia! Now, if you don't know what I'm doing, why I say that, this is Tuesday, April 19th. It's two days after Easter, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, our celebration of the anniversary of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we Christians for centuries have used this greeting to rejoice and share the good news of Jesus Christ our Savior, who even though he died, yet he lived. And we say that he is risen and he is risen indeed to show our joy and our certainty, our confidence in that gospel message that because Christ lives also it means we are forgiven and saved his work is done his work of salvation his work of paying for the price for sin all of that for us it is done it is completed he is he who had died is risen so we say alleluia Christ is risen and the response is he is risen indeed alleluia now, <laughs> the funny part of this is if we're expecting to head on into the resurrection story, we still have John chapter 19 to do, which is a Good Friday story, which is the story of Jesus or, or, um, being delivered over to be crucified and his suffering and death. So uh, our, our travel through John is just a week off of our liturgical calendar traveling. So if this had worked out perfectly well, we would have done John 20 right now and celebrated the resurrection. Alas, this is okay. This is okay that we do it this way, that we celebrate the um, resurrection of Jesus Christ in church and in life it's been Easter but in this little class this little Bible study that we do this little uh, one pastor I know says our romp through the Bible <laughs> romping um, uh, as we go through this we're still on John chapter 19 that's okay because by the way guess what Easter's not over as the church celebrates Easter yes we have the resurrection day uh, uh, on you know that day that we just celebrated two weeks two days ago getting my tongue tied here but the season of Easter continues for 50 days see Lent lasts 40 days and then there's a little fudge factor in there because um, they don't count Sundays but Lent lasts 40 days but the season of Easter is 50 days so uh, not that it's a one-upmanship but for some reason and I, I can tell you why. It lasts 50 days. Um, Jesus ascend, or Jesus rose from the dead, and then we are told 40 days after Easter, after his resurrection, he ascended into heaven. And we could go, oh, well, then that's the end of our season. Except we are also told that the day of Pentecost, which even kind of is in the name, the day of Pentecost was 50 days after Easter. So we do this uh, season of Easter, this season of uh, living in you know, the lessons of the resurrection for 50 days, Easter through Pentecost, okay? But guess what? Pastor, you're getting off on a, on a tangent. This is not liturgy class. This is the book of the month Bible study, Pastor. So we're back to John chapter 19 again. Next week, we have John chapter 20. And, and then before we get to chapter 21, we have to go in May back to Revelation. So I have to figure out what to do with John chapter 21. I guess, um, I guess maybe it's just got to wait till June. And then, I don't know, right? All right, so here we are, John chapter 19. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that we have had this celebration of Easter, this celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Death did not beat him. Death did not hold him down. But Christ is victorious. Uh, and Christ is victorious over sin, death, and Satan. And he gives us, that you give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we pray for your blessings today as we come to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. John chapter 19. So where last we left our hero uh, in last episode, um, we last left Jesus uh, with Pontius Pilate. And he had been being interviewed by Pontius Pilate. And uh, finally, uh, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If, he, they, if my kingdom was of this world, then my followers would be like an army fighting for me. Uh, and then he, uh, a little bit later, he goes on to say, everyone who listens to the truth uh, listens to my voice. And Pontius Pilate, in a very cynical, I think, 21st century way, says, What is truth? Now, I don't really know the tone of voice. That's just how I imagine it. Like, it's this total cynical person of someone who's been wedged in politics and is tired of doing the dance of politics. You know, what is truth? The truth has nothing to do with politics, says Pontius Pilate. Uh, so now we get to... Uh, chapter 19 they had said crucify him and he says well then couldn't I release him for that custom and they said no Barabbas release Barabbas the big old career criminal and uh, he said and so that's where we pick up with this all right let me I'm sorry thank you Tom for the tea all right um, chapter 19 then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. The soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man! When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered you over me over to you has the greater sin. Oh, so, so much is happening here. All right. So let's just kind of walk through this. So then Pilate has him flogged. Well, uh, in American uh, justice, you can't flog someone who's not um, guilty. Right. And as a matter of fact, you can't flog anybody. You can't say, well, let, let me tune him up a little bit and then let him go. Will that make you happy? If I would beat him around a little bit, you know, kick him around the shed a little while? No, <laughs> American justice doesn't do it like that. But this is not America. This is not white glove constitutional freedom. This is Rome. And this is Israel. And the Romans have conquered Israel. And Romans know how to be cruel, right? They're not going to waste time with white glove justice they're gonna get the job done okay no I'm not some I'm not supporting this at all so when Pilate says uh, Pilate has him flogged you know like beat him whip him you know and and get into the historical ideas of what happens when you're flogged and it's not just a, a whip but that it very likely some of these would have been like uh, 
you know, a cat of nine tails or something like that, where the ends of the the whip would have had rocks or, or needles or something like that to induce in, increased pain. So he has Jesus flogged and he's not even guilty, right? Let me let me beat him up a little bit. And the soldiers make a crown of thorns, the, the infamous crown of thorns on Jesus' head. They twist it together and put it on his head and put him in a purple robe. Excuse me, uh, that yawn. You know when you try to hold back a yawn, it never goes away until you finally let it go. So hopefully that's my last yawn. Uh, they put on the crown of thorns, purple robe. He's all bloody from being whipped, uh, all right, and, and flogged. And they're saying, Hail, King of the Jews, right? Um, <laughs> they're trying to tease him. They're trying to joke him, mock him. Um, they're trying to shame him. But they're telling the truth. The King of the Jews. The King of the Jews. Now, uh, ever since a king had been promised to Israel, it would be a king, and that there would one day be the king and that it would be from the house of David, and that this king would be the one who goes for them and fights for them, and that this, excuse me, this king would be the one who would be the son of God, the savior. They don't know, these poor Roman soldiers. Um, they are trying to shame him, but in doing their shame, they, they're calling it out like it really is. Hail, king of the Jews. Now, if you or I, if you're a believer, if you or I had been watching this, we would have stepped forward, the Lord willing, given us courage and faith to say, he is king of the Jews and he's my king too, right? Stop mocking him, right? We wouldn't have wanted to say that. All right, hail king of the Jews. And they strike him again with their hands. And Pilate brings him out and says, See, I'm going to bring him out to you that you can see I find no guilt in him, right? Pilate the judge, Pilate the one who's supposed to bring justice and punishment. And he says, there's nothing wrong, no guilt. Now, that, don't run over that phrase. There's no guilt in Jesus, no blame, no shame, no wrong. If you have no guilt, then you are innocent. Now, legally, a lot of people can have no guilt, but still they can be far from innocent. But what do you have with Jesus? One in whom there is no guilt and no blame and no shame. One in whom not a charge can stick legally or morally or ethically. In Jesus Christ, you have someone who is innocent and pure, really righteous, total moral ethical purity all right who has the guilt i do i do and you do we're sinners and so the guilt is ours but there's no guilt in this jesus christ uh, i said in my good friday sermon he is holy and blameless he is the the one who dies because he is perfect right he's being set up by god to be the sacrifice uh, the people just think they're trying to get rid of a troublesome, the, the chief priests and rulers and things like that. They're just trying to get rid of a troublesome person who, who has created all this religious fervor. But Jesus knows there's nothing wrong with me, and so I will die as the perfect sacrifice. I'm going to die because I'm the one who's perfect. All right? So, uh, Pilate says, you can uh, see that I find no guilt in him. There's no reason he should die. But uh, when he comes out with the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pontius Pilate says, behold, that's the man. There you go. Do you see him? The chief priests and the officers are crying out, crucify, crucify, crucify. They know what they want. They're not, uh, they don't care about justice. And they don't care about truth and they don't care about guilt they know that for their situation they want him to die be dead and die until he's dead right all right and so they cry that out and Pilate tries to say you take him you go crucify him again I find no guilt 
The scriptures are making this clear in chapter 18 and chapter 19 in all four of the Gospels. You should actually go and circle in your Bible in all four of the Gospels in the Passion Accounts where it says that he didn't do anything wrong. He was an innocent man. He doesn't deserve this. It's all over there, right? At the moment that he is being convicted and crucified, there are voices going, he shouldn't be crucified. They see it. Some people see it and they know, right? So Pilate says, you take him. You go crucify him. I find no guilt in him. All right? And they say, well, according to our law, blasphemy. Uh, according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself to be son of God. So if they're going to accuse him of blasphemy, they are going to get the death penalty, or they're trying to. That's what you should get when you mock God, that's blasphemy, or when you take God's divine attributes or name upon yourself, that would be blasphemy too, right? I can mock God, no I won't, um, I can mock God and be accused, rightly accused of blasphemy, or I can claim to be God or try to take God's place. And that would be blasphemy too. Trying to take God out of his throne in our lives. That's blasphemy. All right. And so they're saying he made himself out to be the son of God. So he should die. And actually what they don't know is they're also telling the truth. He is the son of God. And so he should die. Because Jesus is the son of God. That, G that God gives the son of God unto death for our salvation. So the chief priests are telling the truth, but they don't know it. They, they think, well, he's being accused of blasphemy. And God is saying, uh, I'm going to kill him for, being, for telling the truth. Now, God's not bloody, and nor is he uh, just, uh, you know, vindictive. God is offering Jesus as a sacrifice for your sins and mine. Right? You see that? All right. Um, so Pontius Pilate hears um, that he's trying to call himself a god. And uh, he, for one thing, uh, you've got a divine crazy on your hands. If you think, oh no, this Jesus, uh, what are we going to do with this guy? He's a divine crazy man. But also, um, in a world like the Roman Empire where you accuse or where you say that Caesar is God, and now you're trying to bring a new God on the scene. It's kind of a threat to Caesar. It's almost treason, right? Who's the king? If you try to say Jesus is king, uh, then you're almost trying to challenge Caesar's authority. And if you try to say Jesus is God, then it's like you're trying to... So Pontius Pilate says, where are you from? Jesus doesn't answer. Pontius Pilate says, I, don't you know I have the authority to crucify you or to set you free? Now, it's all the divine drama of this is almost like Jesus would be saying, Good, then you have the authority to crucify me. Order me to be crucified, right? In the divine drama, Jesus' mission is to be crucified, to be the sacrifice. Now, he doesn't really want to be sacrificed for himself. You know, whoo, no one's going to say, Jesus says, I want to do this uh, for me. He says, if there's any other way, Lord, let this cup pass for me, but yet not as I will, as you will, right? Of course, no one says, I'd like to sign up for uh, sacrificial death. Um, but we will do what must be done sometimes to protect others, right? Um, if you've ever had a, a parental or maternal instinct, kick in when your child might be in danger, you know that you're willing to stand in the way of danger to protect your children. Uh, that's a strange feeling, by the way. Uh, okay, so, uh, but it's very natural, and it's very right. Okay, okay, um, so Pontius Pilate says, I could crucify you, and, and Jesus says, yeah, but you have that right and authority to crucify me because you have the authority given from God uh, to ha to do this kind of government justice, right? God allows and sanctifies governments to do their work. Um, but he says, "But the greater sin belongs to the one who handed you over to handed me over to you." You know, the real fault here falls with Caiaphas. 
the high priest who said, send him to Pontius Pilate. Let's take him there and have him crucified. All right. Uh, so verse 12. Uh, John chapter 19, verse 12 is where we are. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when, pa when Pontius Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and, and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pontius Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Um, so he delivered him over to them to be crucified. Oh my goodness, there's some things happening here that, um, you know, you ought to hear the music in the background going, bum, 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 or anything like that, right? So, and it happens, at, by the way, let me, let's just say this, let's put it out there, it's a nasty word in our common usage, politics, right? One of the things that's happening in John chapter 18 and 19 is politics. You got the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, trying to manage Jerusalem and Judea. And you have the chief priests who have a secular, uh, you know, a, a sacred authority o over the temple and, and over the teachings. But they also, along with the Sanhedrin, have this, they represent the people. You know, and because you've got the Roman rule over an indigenous people, over the Israelites, um, that uh, so the, the chief priests and the officers and the Sanhedrin, the, you've got this politics as we're going after our governor, and our governor's trying to keep order, right? Uh, that's the first thing the governor wants, is everybody to obey and, and be ordered well, so that there's peace and not conflict, right? Uh, so in one sense, maybe Pontius Pilate isn't concerned with what's right, but what's expedient and pragmatic for keeping the people out of trouble, right? Um, but the, the politics here, now they're going to put Pontius Pilate, they're going to wedge him in between the Israelites, in between Jesus and Caesar, right? Pontius Pilate, if you release him, you are not Caesar's friend. So this was kind of a thing to be known. Are you good with Caesar or are you uh, on the outs with Caesar? You know, are you in political favor with the emperor? Um, and I don't know if we have kind of a name for it, but uh, you, you know that there's politicians that uh, the, the king or the president uh, will want to work with. And there's politicians that the king or the president won't want to work with, right, in our world today. So... If you release Jesus, who calls himself a king, you're you're working against Caesar, your boss's <laughs> uh, will, and uh, you could be in trouble with your boss for having bad politics and, and supporting something that could weaken uh, Caesar's nation and his rule, right? So if you let him go, this could be bad for you and your job and your political career, right? And and when something goes bad for you in a political career in Rome, that means you die. <laughs> okay, um, everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. If Jesus is king, you better oppose Jesus. Otherwise, if you support Jesus, you're opposing Caesar. <gasps> so Pilate hears these things. And he brings out Jesus and they, this place called the Stone Pavement, or Gabbatha, is the judgment seat where he can make his pronouncement. And uh, so he says, Behold your king, right? Um, I, there's a painting, and I think it's like Ecce Homino or something like that. Um, that, uh, you know, here's the king or this man or something like that. 
Um, but behold your king. And the Jews just go crazy. Crucify him. Crucify him. What? You want to crucify your king? Right? This guy's, you know, and so it's a bit of a mocking situation to hear. Pontius Pilate's not going to just roll over uh, like a dog for the Israelites. Uh, so he's kind of calling them, you know, this is your king. Right? It's an insult. It's a jab. You know, you're you're saying he's made himself a king over you. He says he's the king of the Jews, so he must be your king, right? So uh, Pontius Pilate's trying to just really wrangle and wrestle with these guys and tangle with them. Uh, and they say, we have no king but Caesar. And that's when I said the bump, bump, bump ought to go off because that's, for an Israelite, that's crazy talk. For an Old Testament person who knows the Jewish scriptures who knows the old testament scriptures who knows the covenants of god they are not supposed to be ruled by gentiles they are not supposed to have any gentile authority they are not supposed to have any king except for the king that god himself sets up over israel they are, they need to have a davidic king right they need yahweh to actually be the great high king over israel himself uh, and they say, we have abandoned all of that. They don't realize what they're saying, but they should. Caesar is our king. It should have, like, tasted like tar in their mouth. It should have tasted awful to say that as an Israelite. To say, Caesar's our only king. We don't have any other king. Because they, they're, they're not supposed to like the Roman Empire as good Jewish people in this time. And it should have tasted like tar in their mouth to kind of kiss up to Caesar in that way. Uh, to kind of challenge, you know, use this as if our only thing is to obey the Roman emperor. Ah, uh, they should have been like, we can't say that. But they did. We have no king but Caesar. We reject Jesus as our king. We reject the Messiah that God has provided. They don't see or know what they're doing, I think. We have no king but Caesar. And so Pontius Pilate has no choice politically, politically, but to crucify Jesus. I want to take a minute. Uh, maybe I did this last week. I, it just Last week was Holy Week, so I don't remember last week. It was just all so crazy and busy. I want to take a minute. Uh, are we supposed to like Pontius Pilate or not? Because, uh, you know, in one sense, he keeps saying, no, I don't want to crucify him. Jesus is innocent. No, I don't want to crucify, crucify him. I find no guilt in him. There's no reason to do this. And so you could say Pontius Pilate was fighting for Jesus' life. Uh, and it could have been that he's just trying not to let the the uh, Jewish authorities, the chief priests, you know, run roughshod over Roman justice. You know, it could be that uh, Pontius Pilate didn't care about Jesus necessarily, and maybe as a politician, only nominally con uh, cared about justice. But he cared, uh, maybe if if you're following this theory, he cared about Roman power, Roman authority. Rome's ability to do things and not be pushed around by the natives, right? Uh, and so in one sense, um, you know, is, is Pontius Pilate uh, a righteous person? Are we supposed to like him like he fought for Jesus? And I think we're supposed to see that he's, for whatever reason, he, his words were trying to keep Jesus alive, right? Now, also, let's remember, Jesus died because it was God's plan to have this come about. But looking at the human players on the field, uh, you could say Pontius Pilate sure seemed to be fighting on Jesus' side for life. He didn't understand God's plan either. But maybe Pontius Pilate wasn't so bad. Uh, Extra-biblical stuff shows that he also had some events, you know, that he, uh, well, even the Bible shows that he, um, you know, combined the blood of some criminals, some traitors, uh, with the blood of their sacrifices. I mean, what an abomination 
uh, in, in the ways of the Old Testament worship laws and things like that. He just didn't care. Um, so uh, maybe we want to fight for Pontius Pilate being a good guy. But maybe we also can see evidence that he clearly wasn't a good guy. Um, uh, I hope that you can meet Pontius Pilate in heaven. But I can't say anything more than the scripture says. And the scripture never gives you any confidence that Pontius Pilate ever became a Christian. It just showed that there was a way in which Pontius Pilate was trying to recognize that this was injustice. All right, so uh, you get it? Uh, if we're trying to decide what to do about Pontius Pilate, you kind of are free to make your own guess, but you're not free to decide what it is. Right, because the Bible doesn't tell us what it is. Was Pontius Pilate saved believer in Jesus Christ? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. Was Pontius Pilate a, a rejecter of Jesus Christ as the Savior of his own heart and soul? It doesn't say that. Right? What happens after Easter? You know, did Pontius Pilate ever come to faith? It doesn't say that. History, I don't think, makes any clue that he would be, have become a Christian. So uh, if you want to think and hope in your heart that Pontius Pilate became a Christian uh, because he had a little scintilla, a little spark of, of, of good works in him, that's just going to be your own hope and your own wish. Okay. Now if you want to just think that you know for certain that Pontius Pilate absolutely never came to faith in Jesus Christ, same thing. You don't know that. And, and we just don't know. Maybe he came to faith later on and it's not recorded because at this time it wasn't good for Roman centurions to come to, or for Roman governors to have faith in Jesus Christ, the, a native, a God of the natives. Right? So we don't know. All right. Um, okay. So if that little aside on Pontius Pilate all to say that we just aren't sure that we can say anything more than the scripture says. All right? Was he saved? I don't know. Was he condemned? I don't know. What did he do? Well, it looked like he tried to save Jesus' life. But then what happened? Well, he gave up. Why? Because of politics, apparently. Uh, because he couldn't resist the violent will of the mob at that time. All right. So let's continue. Uh, John chapter 19, verse 16. The second half of verse 16 begins a new paragraph. So they took Jesus, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pontius Pilate also wrote an inscription, uh, and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the King of the Jews. And Pontius Pilate says, I, What I have written, I have written. All right, um, so they take Jesus and crucify him. Uh, thankfully, the Gospel of John does not go into any great detail about the, the bone sound, the nail sound, the gushy, bloody sound, the, the pain involved. Uh, you can imagine that. You can look it up. You can Im imagine and look it up uh, both together. You can guess at what it is like to be crucified, but I think we got a good idea, right? They are nailing him and then lifting him up so that he can die nailed to a stick, right? To a cross, to two beams of wood. Um, and it's on this certain hill called the place of a skull called Golgotha. Now, if you know the, the story of the Holy Land of Jerusalem, that there's one place that is considered 
the historically recognized place that G maybe Jesus was crucified. Uh, but there's also another place that possibly fits this description, which was uh, named or guessed at or whatever by a guy in the 1800s. So which one is true? I don't know, right? Now, I tend to say, uh, historically, I'm going to trust a long 1800 years of history rather than to say, oh, I think this guy came along in it in the year, you know, 1850, whatever. And he finally got it right after two thousand, almost two thousand years. Uh, I so now does it matter? Not really to me because I've never been there and I don't need to see the hill to have faith in Christ. So I would guess, and I could be wrong, that the historic site is the site of Jesus' death and burial. So, but so they crucify him there, and uh, there uh, Pontius Pilate puts this placard up. And it's in three different languages, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew or Aramaic, right? Why? Well, Aramaic was the, the language of the home of that region, right? That's what people spoke at home. And Latin would have been the language of the government, of Rome, right? And so official matters would have been in uh, Latin. And Greek would have been the language of business. Uh, you know, so across the whole Mediterranean area, the businessmen spoke Greek. And so if, if any gen, generally, if you spoke Aramaic, that's because you lived in that area. If you spoke Latin, it's because you had been educated to uh, speak with the government. And if you spoke Greek, it was because you'd been educated to speak and do business. So, uh, by the way, fishermen are businessmen, right? They're not just some sort of, you know, uh, some people say, oh, these dumb fishermen. Uh, fishermen have to know how to sell their fish. And so um, that's possibly one reason why the New Testament was written in Greek, because many of his disciples were fishermen. But I'm stretching there. Um, so it's written in Latin and in Aramaic and Greek. Jesus of Nazareth, you know, uh, lacking last names, it would be Jesus of San Francisco, Jesus of Riverview, right? So Jesus of the town he's from, Jesus of Nazareth. And what's the charge against him? He's the king of the Jews. He tells the exact truth. Uh, maybe Pontius Pilate did it for the wrong reason. Maybe Pontius Pilate did it to mock the Jews. But this is the biblical truth as well. Who is that that's dying there, God? The king of the Jews. The one who will fight for his people and offer his life for his people as a sacrifice for their good and for their salvation. Uh, so they say, well, don't, you know, the chief priests, don't put this man said, that's no fair to us. Put that, I mean, don't put that this man was, but put that he said he was. Pontius Pilate says, I'm not changing it, okay? What I've written, I've written. That's the that's the accusation. And I think it's because God told, made sure that he wrote the true charge, not some sort of waffly thing. Well, he thought he was the king of the Jews. No. God wants it to be known. This is the king of the Jews, right? This is the Jesus Christ himself, all right? So uh, that's up to verse 22. How are we doing on time? Doing okay. Uh, verse 23 and following when the soldiers had crucified Jesus they took his garments and divided them into four parts one part for each soldier also his tunic but the tunic was seamless woven in one piece from top to bottom so they said to one another let us not tear it but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be this was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his home. 
All right, now we also got to deal with a little bit of PC here, a little bit of political correctness, but we will. All right, all right. So uh, this is also just to fulfill the scriptures that there was a time where uh, in Psalm 22, where it would say they divided my garments among them. Uh, so here it is like this big sign. Hey, uh, these soldiers are splitting up his clothing. Isn't that like Psalm 22, people? Like the way Jesus, uh, God is making this thing come true in Jesus' life. Uh, so what is it? Uh, so they take his clothing. What, I, I don't know how many clothes he's wearing. Uh, but, uh, you know, they cut it into pieces. You, you take that. Take that home to your wife or to your servant, and she'll do it. You know, so they cut it up along the seams, right? But the tunic, probably the outer shirt, um, it was woven just, you know, as one piece. So uh, they don't want to cut it up. That would be awful. So th it's woven as one piece. So then they're like casting lots. Imagine just rolling dice, you know, high dice wins. And gets to see who gets his clothes. Uh, now I, uh, you know, looking backwards, knowing that Jesus is the Son of God, I would hate to be the one who says, "I won his robe. I got his tunic." You know, probably that day they're like, "Yes, I got his tunic. Free clothes for the centurion." Um, but afterwards, you know, can you imagine me today, a believer, and you, a believer, suddenly saying, "I was so happy that I got his clothes away from him." from my Savior and Lord? You know, afterwards, kind of hindsight, if someone said, uh, um, we're getting rid of his clothes, do you want it? Um, how, how does the faithful answer? Yes, give me the clothes of my Savior that I may hold them dearly. Or, or yes, give me the clothes of my Savior that I can wear them. You know, it's just kind of a strange thing. All right, so there's that. But then this, the rest of the paragraph says also, his mother was at the foot of the cross, but standing by the cross were, now there's either two people or, there's either three people or four here. It's kind of a little confusing that way. Was his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene? Now are we to understand that his mother's sister is Mary the wife of Clopas? Now uh, other people probably have this figured out. I don't, okay? Uh, are there three people or four? Mary, her sister, and Mary of, of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, right? So which is it? Is it three people or four? I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, if it's Mary and her sister, and they're both named Mary? I don't know. I, I, you know uh, I'm sure someone can offer an answer to that. And maybe it's her sister-in-law, and Clopas is her sister, you know, so maybe it's that, or maybe it's Joseph's sister named Mary. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Thirsty today. All right. Um, but standing by, and then Jesus see his mother whom he loves, and the disciple whom he loves, which... We understand whenever the Gospel of John says the disciple whom he loved, it's talking about John. I can go into the whole story there, but that's what it is. All right. And so uh, he says, woman, behold your son. Now, here's the PC business. Are we to regard Jesus as going, uh, you know, like it would be in America? Woman. No, okay, I'm not making fun of that. I, I'm, I'm, I guess, teasing it. I'm not in support of that at all. That, um, but in, in the Greek at this time, it would not have been um, woman, as in some sort of insulting thing like, uh, you know, let me just, I'm insulting. Get back in the kitchen, woman, right? Uh, you're not supposed to be here, woman. Right, not, none of that. Right, none of this. This is men's work, you woman. No, none of that. This is delivered as a way of saying, "Dear mother, dear woman, that is that is your son. Consider him to be your son." Right. So, if you have to, and some Bible translations put "dear" in front of it to kind of communicate in English that this is not an insult. Um, but that it is 
uh, Jesus trying to talk to his his mother uh, with respect. There's no disrespect meant here when it says, Woman, behold your son. We Americans hear it that way, but it's not that. And what and son, behold your mother, right? Uh, sir or whatever. Behold your mother. Um, he's going to look after you now, Mary. And John, you're going to look after her now. I'm, I'm putting her into your care. Now that's the good thing. Um, that you know they didn't have social security back then or 401ks your retirement plan was to have children to care for you in your old age so this is uh now the the gospel or the um disciple john the apostle john the gospel writer john uh this one person uh now has this uh privilege this responsibility uh, this is put on him by his dear friend because you got to admit you would not say you're going to take care of my mother if you weren't friends with someone right and you're not going to say dear stranger here's my mother that would be huh you know um, unthinkable so uh, behold your mother he's saying to John you have to take care of her now so even on the cross he is looking after the physical needs of those that he loves. That's huge, right? That he could not only say, I'm thinking about people's spirit here, but he looks after the general daily welfare of uh, those that he loves, of his mother-in-law and such, okay? All right, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour, sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished, and bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Um, I want to go start with the it is finished. Uh, the other Gospels kind of make this clear that he called out with a loud voice. Okay? So when Jesus says it is finished, he's not kind of, I'm finally done with finals. Um, he is saying, I'm done. I've completed the work. It is finished. There's no more work to do. Um, and, and so, you know, this is a victory cry. I am done. The work of salvation is complete and you are saved. It's as if he's saying that, right? And then he gives up his spirit. I like this active voice that Jesus doesn't die. Jesus doesn't lose his spirit. It's not taken from him. He's not overcome with uh, weakness. It says he gave up his spirit. Now, whether you can really mean something from that or not, I do, right? It's no passive word. It is that he said, now's the time I die. And he, so he died by choice. Okay, uh, but what was the other thing here? Um, he thirsts, and so they put a wine on a hyssop plant and give it give it to him. Well, uh, now I've heard some things about this um, uh, sponge that they use to put wine on it. I don't know if it's true. Uh, someone says that this is the kind of sponge that soldiers might have used to um, wipe themselves. You get, get that gross, right? I don't know if it's true, and it, it doesn't really matter, but it, it, no, it really doesn't matter because it would just be more details of how gruesome uh, this sit whole situation is that he's living in and he's dying in. Um, but in another sense, he would have done the work, whether that was a clean, you know, um, antiseptic uh, sponge or not. Um, but they put wine on the sponge, sour wine, and they hold it up to his mouth. Um, Jesus had just said he would not drink it again until he's with them in his kingdom. And I have to kind of think about this because uh, he said he would not drink wine again, the fruit of the vine, uh, until he drinks again in his kingdom. And to me, 
he's in his kingdom right now, hanging on the on a cross and you know on a throne basically in heaven or in um, Golgotha. He's hanging by a cross right now, but this is his kingdom. This is where Christ is reigning over all of us in his biggest glory. So I wonder about that. Uh, is this his kingdom? Because he's drinking wine now. But uh, so you got to kind of think about that and look it up. But also, um, it's this sour wine, and so this is what I've heard: is this sour wine is like you know the uh, the the Schlitz, the cheap beer, the college beer, you know the fifty cent beer uh, that uh, people always used to get to get the cheap beer to get the easy bus, you know, and that these Roman soldiers who are kind of living day by day, night by night, you know, the donut policemen of the Roman Empire. Um, policemen, I'm just working with stereotypes. So if you're a policeman, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to offend. Um, you know, but it's cheap beer that a soldier might drink, right? None of the fancy schmancy emperor kind of stuff, right? Um, but he finished, it is finished. And he dies and he gives up his spirit okay so we are kind of moving into the last few minutes here so let's do this since it was the day of preparation and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath for that Sabbath was a high day the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away so this the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out um, there came out blood and water. And he who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, They will look on him in whom they have pierced. Oh. Uh, okay, so um, we, have a, we really have a textual uh, challenge here. Uh, what day did he die? Uh, the, the regular Gospels will make it sound like he died on Friday. And and so there's the third day, and uh, you know Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and it makes it sound like he died on the day of Passover, um, and and yet here in the Gospel of John it kind of presents a, a slightly different story that this is the day of preparation of Passover. I um, th there's a way to see this, and I think the 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 the, the 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 challenge here also for one is to recognize that scripture doesn't always give us the answers we want but it sounds as if the book of John is presenting this like he maybe he died on a Thursday and then the Passover meal is eaten you know after sundown and that makes it the next day kind of a thing I can explain this better if you need me to um, but that you know they need to uh, get Jesus down from the tree before Passover begins um, and, and there's different theories like there's these high days uh, so there might have been more than one Sabbath there's different theories like um, there's different calendars there's a Jewish calendar and then the Roman calendar and maybe Matthew Mark and Luke were following the Roman calendar and maybe John was following a Jewish calendar and I don't know Okay, you just gotta let me kind of say I don't know how I'm supposed to work through this. I think uh, if you were like, well, did Jesus really die on a Friday? Have we been wrong about this for twenty two thousand years, for twenty centuries? I don't think so. Uh, but then, what do I do with the Gospel of John? I don't know. Okay, so I'm not saying the Gospel of John is wrong, and I'm not saying Matthew, Mark, and Luke are wrong. I'm saying they might be telling the same story in two different ways. Of which neither are wrong because I believe both of them all four Gospels would be uh, the Word of God which does not lie so uh, I don't know how to, to make sense of it okay sorry all right 
it, it's the best I can do. You have to do your study notes if you really want to tackle that study. Um, you have to go deeper than Wikipedia. And that's a little shout out also to my sister-in-law Miriam, who says Wikipedia is not good for research. Uh, I agree, but you, most of us don't do research. We're just looking for an easy answer, right? But if this, if you really want to kind of figure this out, you don't do research. You got to dig deeper into the the uh, commentaries and things like that. And I can help you with those resources if you need. But that's that. All right. So let's do this here. Verse thirty-eight. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloth, with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Uh, okay, now uh, to understand some of this is to understand that there are different burial customs even today. Uh, the Jewish people will have, um, generally, you have to bury the body very quickly compared to other Gentile customs. Um, and, and part of that is because they don't embalm, they don't preserve the body in this kind of necessarily any way. Um, you might refrigerate it for a while, but generally you are same day or next day kind of having a service and a burial kind of a thing even today so uh, for them they finally get him into the tomb before sundown before the new day begins which is a Sabbath which is a high Sabbath right um, and, and so they get Jesus down from the cross and, and put him in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb which was close by um, and uh, it says they brought the, the myrrhs and aloes, about 75 pounds. So I don't know how many pounds of, of uh, lotions and um, uh, perfumic things do you need to prepare a body? I don't know. And maybe the bottles themselves contribute to the weight. But um, 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes. Uh, it seems like a lot to me, but maybe I just don't know. Um, but they really wanted to make sure they had enough. And so they, you know, uh, their burial customs of the Jews were different then than they are now, right? Just got to go with that. If you can't picture that, I don't know how we could talk through this any better. Um, so they, they go to, and prepare this and they manage to get him buried up before the Sabbath belong, uh, begins. Um, and, and But there was this understanding that the women will come on Sunday and finish the um, preparation, finish the, the way that you would prepare a body respectfully for, for death, for funeral. All right? And, and this is in the garden, and, and the tomb is close by where he was crucified. I think that's very interesting. Now, it's, a, it's a fact that I missed uh, somewhere along the way, that it wasn't, you know, two blocks down and three blocks over. There Jesus is buried but it's essentially on the same hill as his crucifixion is his tomb. And it's so obvious, it's right there in verse 42, but I, I missed it for a long time. And then it was just recently that it stuck out to me so because someone pointed it out that he was buried very close by because it makes it sound like it's on the same hill, right? He's buried and then just kind of walked down the hill and put him in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb that he owned, right? So that's what they're doing. Now, in the meantime, let's picture this from all four Gospels. They, they knew that they had to protect his body. The authorities knew that they had to protect his body and no one could say that they robbed the grave and he was alive again because there's no body, right? No grave robbing alive Jesus theory. Um, and so they made that uh, tomb up as secure as it could be. 
uh, as they could hope to secure it, and it doesn't work. But that's more discussion for next week. Ah. All right. So that's where we should stop. All right. Uh, let us close in prayer. Using again, as I often do, the, some prayers that are found in the footnotes of the Lutheran Study Bible. Dear Lord, you became one with us in death, that we may look to you for life. Amen. All right, God's blessings on your day, a very blessed Easter week and season. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We'll talk to you later. Bye.